Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the degree of a field extension and the tower law. Okay, right, so we have just proven that this set, which contains all things of the form yj xi, where uh, i can vary between 1 and little m, and j can vary between 1 and little n, uh, that this, which is a set of elements in m, is a basis for the vector space of M over the scalar field K. Right, so we've just proven that it spans, okay? Uh, what we now want to prove is that this is linearly independent, basically. We want to prove that all of these elements are linearly independent. Now, what does it mean to prove that they are all uh, linearly independent? Well, it means that uh, the only solution to this equation Okay, so let's say the sum from i is equal to 1 to m, and the sum from j is equal to 1 to n. Okay, and then we'll say b i j again, y j x i. Okay, so the only linear combination that you can take of these elements where b i j are in the uh, small field k uh, that gives you the zero vector is if all of these are the zero element within the field K, basically. Absolutely all of them, and that's for all I and J, basically. So that's the only solution to this equation, basically. That's what we need to prove. Okay, so let's hypothesize. Let's assume that we have a solution to this equation. So we have some BIJs which satisfy this, and we now want to prove that all of the BIJs are equal to zero. Well, basically, we're going to do the exact backward steps of what we did uh, to show that it spans. Okay, so firstly, we're going to say, okay, let's undistribute it. Let's reverse distributivity. So, if we think about this second summation here, it doesn't involve i at all. xi is a constant. So basically, for all j varying between 1 and n, you are multiplying them by a constant, which is x with a fixed i there. So i is not varying in this sum. So we can basically pull it out. Okay, so we're now reversing distributivity this time. And that's the crux to these proofs, basically. Distributivity. Okay. Then what we're going to get is that it's the sum from i is equal to 1 to n, and then we've got xi times j is equal to 1 to n of b i j y j. Now, remember, b i j were all elements of k, and the y j's, the y1, y2, all the way up to y n, they formed a basis of the vector space of L over the scalar field K, basically. That's, remember, where we got these Y's from initially. They were the basis elements within L uh, for the whole vector space, basically. So, what does that mean? Well, you've taken a linear combination of these basis elements and the, uh, uh, the coefficients, basically, to all the basis elements are within this smaller field, K here, the scalar field for uh, the vector space L, basically. Okay, so that means that this element must be some element of L. Okay, so each one of these, whichever I you select, this is going to be an element of L. So let's now call this AI, because this number that you get here will just depend on what I you stick in there. So for instance, if you stick in I is equal to 1 and do this sum, you'll get a certain element of L. If you stick in I is equal to 2, you'll get a different element of L. So it will depend on I, so I'll put AI back there, and basically I'm just reversing exactly what I uh, did in the previous um, argument. Okay, so this becomes the sum from I is equal to 1 to n xi times ai, where ai are all in L. And what was the equation that we originally had? It was that this thing was equal to zero. So basically, I am saying that I have a linear combination of the xi's, uh, where the coefficients are within L, which gives you the zero vector. 
Okay, now why is that so interesting? Well, because Xi's, the X1, X2, all the way up to Xm, those formed a basis of the vector space M over L, basically. So, I have taken a linear combination of these where the coefficients are within L, okay? Now, because this is a basis, they must be linearly independent. So the only way that you can take a linear combination of these uh, over the field L and get the answer, the zero vector, is if all of them are zero. So that tells us that the AIs are all equal to the zero um, element of the field L, okay? So that tells us instantly that the sum from J is equal to one to N of B, I, J, yj is equal to zero for all i, basically. Okay, and you might wonder, well, don't we need to worry a bit more here about, uh, you know, this is the zero element within the field L, uh, which is probably different from the zero element in the field K, but you don't. Because remember, we're not just talking about abstract vector spaces, we are talking about fields. And all of these fields are nested within each other. So remember how beautiful it is that we're talking here always about the same same zero element. Okay, so that's why this is so much more beautiful than the theory of abstract vector spaces because we know what we're dealing with here. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, we now know uh, that these sums must always be equal to zero within uh, the field L, basically. Okay? Uh, and that's for all i, whatever i is, so whether i is 1, 2, or all the way up to m, basically. So, we know that the bij's are within the small field k, okay, for all i and for all j, okay. We also know that this uh, set of yj's, where y is from 1 to n, that this is a basis for the vector space L over k, Okay, so we now have a linear combination of these basis elements, which is going to give us the zero uh, element of the field or vector space L, basically. Now, of course, we know, because this was hypothesized to be a basis and therefore linearly independent, that the only way that can occur is if all of these coefficients in front of them are equal to the zero element within the field K. Okay, so that tells us instantly that Bij is equal to zero uh, for all j as well. And we already had that it was true for all i. So it's now true for all j and for all i, basically. So, um, for all i and for all j, that now shows that these b coefficients must be equal to zero within the field k. And that now confirms that if you have an equation like this, the only solution to it is if all of those coefficients are equal to zero. So that now shows that this set is linearly independent. So we have now proven that that spans at the vector space m over k. Okay, so if we now want to take the degree of this field extension, all we need to do is work out how many elements are within that set. Well, that's easy. Remember this drawing here, where we show, drew out all the elements. We have a, basically a table here, and the size of this are well, the size of this aspect of the table here is that you have n elements along there, and then you have m going downwards, so the total number is n times m, so the size of this, um, well, the, the degree of this field extension is going to be m times n, okay, but remember, m was the degree of the field extension of m over l, and n was the degree of the field extension of l over k, okay, so that now shows the tower rule is true. Uh, providing that both of these are finite, basically. So what we now just want to uh, do, the little caveat, is that if either of these is infinite, we need to show that this is also infinite, and therefore that the tower rule also holds true. So, we'll start off with, what if m over l is infinite? Okay, so if m over l is infinite. Why does that mean that m over k is also, therefore, uh, going to be infinite? Well, basically, 
uh, this shows us that um, if we take the size of a basis of the vector space M over L, okay, so if we have a basis, let's say, for M over L, uh, and we'll call these the X elements again, X1, X2, all the way on, and it never ends, basically, it's infinite now, so we have a basis which is infinite uh, for M over L, okay, and Basically, what this means is that if I take some arbitrary element of the set N, uh, I can take a linear combination of these basis elements where the coefficients are within L and get that element, okay? So that's just the definition of a basis. So there will always exist some linear combination of this basis which will uh, add up to that um, element of my uh, vector space N. Basically, if I now want to talk about uh, the vector space of M over K, then there is not a chance that I will be able to find a basis of M over, uh, over the field K that is smaller than this. Because if you think about taking this basis here and now using that, then that might not even span it anymore because the coefficients which were originally in L Okay, so if these coefficients are allowed to be anything in L, then uh, you can get any element within this uh, vector space M by taking linear combinations. But now I'm restricting them down to being in a smaller field, being in the field K, then I might not actually even be able to get every element anymore. So the best it can possibly do is achieve the same. It can't possibly be smaller, basically. Okay, and in fact, this basis might not even be a basis anymore uh, for uh, the vector space M over K because, as I say, it may no longer span. Okay, so basically, if you need an infinite basis to span uh, the vector space of M uh, over this larger field L, then you're certainly not going to somehow suddenly get uh, a smaller basis when you're dealing with a smaller field K. That's just not going to happen, basically. So, if this is infinite, then this has to be infinite as well. Now, if L over K is infinite, so if this one is now infinite, then we need to also show that M over K is infinite. So, again, this means that in order to span the vector space L, you need an infinite number of basis vectors within L. Now, if you want, you could think about M and L both being vector spaces over K. So K is a subfield of both of them, so you can think of them as both being vector spaces over uh, K. Now, L is completely contained within M, okay? So remember, just to try and draw a picture, you have, let's say this is M, this is L now, and then at right at the bottom, this is K. Whoops. There. Okay, so this is K, all of this is then L, and then the whole thing is M. Okay, so you could view L as being a subspace of the vector space M when we are talking about both of them as vector spaces over the field K. Now, if the uh, vector space L requires an infinite basis to span it, then there is not a hope that you are going to suddenly be able to find a finite basis to cover, uh, to, sorry, to span uh, the entire vector space M, because the vector space M has more elements in it than L. So, basically, you know, if you, if you have to have an infinite basis to cover, to span L, uh, then you still need all those basis elements to cover all those elements of L when you're trying to produce a basis of M because all of those elements of L are still within uh, the vector space M, basically. Okay, uh, so again, if the... Um, if the uh, degree of L over K is infinite, then that is also going to imply that the, the, the degree of M over K is infinite. So, if these two are finite, then this rule applies. If these two aren't finite, then this rule also applies, because uh, if you have infinity on one side, it will imply that the other side is, is infinity, and when you multiply infinity by anything, it stays as infinity. So the tower rule is going to hold even um, when uh, we're not dealing with finite degree field extensions. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.